Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Sitting with me today is Stuart Feierstein, Columbia professor of neuroscience and author of very interesting books, Failure and Ignorance. And today, we're going to talk about murder mysteries and the scientific process. Stuart, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. In the Hulu hit, only murders in the building, Steve Martin, Selena Gomez, and Martin Short are true crime mystery fans who team up to investigate the death of a neighbor. But at the top of the show, our intrepid team of investigators are not even sure there has been a murder in their building. They're stumbling around in the dark, looking for something that might not even be there. It's not like that in science, right? Oh, no, 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 never. No, I'd say that's exactly how it is in science, actually. I like to use this phrase that science is best described by an old aphorism of, of anonymous source, uh, which says um, it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially if there is no cat. And I think that's really a great description of what happens mostly in science. That may not be what it looks like, but that's how it goes. The characters played by Martin Gomez and Short are not following any set of rules. They're not on any rigorous or predetermined path towards capital A answers. And of course, that's not how science is done, right? <laughs> no, of course not. Yes, I mean, almost always it's done that way, in spite of, I'm afraid, what we're often taught in school, that there's a scientific method and this and that. But, but there is, I mean, there is a, such a thing called the scientific method, I guess, although that's a very late phrase, only developed by educators, really, to teach this idea of a process, which says, you know, you observe, you make a hypothesis, you observe some more, you do an experiment, and then you change your, you update your hypothesis. And that all sounds fine. I've never known anybody who's made a discovery that way. You sometimes check your work that way. It's very useful that, for that. But in science, I, uh, what I object to is the word method, to tell you the truth, that as if there's a method or a recipe for doing science. And you just, you know, you put the data here, you turn the crank and out fall gadgets and cures and knowledge and things like that. And it's much messier, I'm afraid, much, much messier. Divine Joy Randolph plays Detective Williams. She is ready to believe exactly what she sees. Tim Kono committed suicide case closed. She does not challenge her sources or doubt the facts as they are placed in front of her. And she fails very badly, which makes for great drama. But is that kind of blind adherence to established facts good for science or, or good for anybody? No, I don't think so. Not only blind adherence to established facts, but blind adherence to your first perceptions, to your first idea of what something looks like, because it fits. And if it fits what you thought it should be, then you're kind of done with it. There's a very strong chance that the killer is musical superstar Sting. You know, there's a wonderful example of this that I got from the famous magician Apollo Robbins. He's known as the gentleman's pickpocket. He has this thing about how to hide a dead body just in case your viewers want to get an idea about how to hide a dead body, you know, learn something useful on this show. And the way you do it is you take your dead body out to the middle of the park, the middle of the local park, not hidden away in the woods somewhere, because that'll always be discovered. You know how that goes. Right in the middle of the park, you dig a hole eight feet deep. You throw the body in, you fill it up to four feet, and you throw in the body of a dead dog. And then you fill it up the rest of the way, tamp it down, and go, don't make it look too good. The next day, the police come out looking for the dead body. They see what looks like a hole that was dug. They bring the cadaver dogs. They start barking. They dig. At four feet, they reach the dead dog, and they go, huh, somebody's dog died. They came out last night and buried it, and on they go. And the dead body, when will it be found? Maybe never. Right. So how often do we do that? Not only in science, but in our lives. We get the answer we expect and we move on. But that might not be the, the big answer, the real answer. Do you think that that kind of mindset is good for, let's say, a democracy? Well, okay, clearly not so. I mean, this is what I think we mean by critical thinking, which is not to ever accept the first thing that looks good. Um, it, that may be turn out to be the right thing. It may turn out that that's right. But, but why take the very first answer? It's almost always likely to be not the full answer, not the full thing. But it's expensive to find the body once you have the dog. Uh, yes. <laughs> but then again, do you want to just leave the body there or do you want to find the body? You know, I, I mean, want but, the body. Yes, that's what I think we all would, would say. So, sure, there's always a balance. I mean, at some point you say, well, 
all right, we're just not going to find this body because it's just not worth all this extra money, effort, time, and so forth and so on. And sometimes you do that and come back to it years later, and now it's a skeleton and an anthropologist finds it. And it's great because the body got left there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you never know how these things can work out in the long run, do you? Stuart Firestein wrote the book on failure, literally. The second book in his series is called Failure, Why Science is So Successful. And in most murder mysteries, the first steps towards solving the case is usually a series of failures, like the prime suspect with an alibi or the discovery that the supposed suicide Tim Kono had just purchased an expensive engagement ring. The episodes are practically a checklist of their failed attempts to solve the puzzle. You write about different kinds of failures. Is this checklist of sort of failure a useful failure? So, yes, I think that's a, I, I think in some cases they're a useful failure. This is one way of failing. I think failure is one of these under, um, under investigated, underrepresented terms. It's a word that's forced to cover too many things. I think that the important thing about failure, the useful failure, is that it's not just retroactively valuable. That is, it's not, well, we fail and then we learn something from our failure and then we succeed. That would be one way to look at it. And that's okay. That, that's fine. One should learn from their failures. But I also think, especially in science, as in murder mysteries, perhaps, failure is an integral part of the process. It's, I don't see success and failure as flip sides of the same coin, but rather as like, uh, two horses pulling the same wagon in the same direction. It, it's absolutely critical to the process. There's a wonderful uh, phrase from Gertrude Stein, the always enigmatic Gertrude Stein, in which she says, a real failure needs no excuse. It is an end in itself. And thinking about failure as an end in itself, it's not easy because we generally think fail, learn, succeed, et cetera, you know, fail fast, fail better is the tech industry idea and all that. But, but the idea of actually including failure in your process, I think, is important because it tells you a fundamental thing about ignorance. It tells you what you don't know, you don't know. Mm. So if you think science or murder mysteries are initially about what you don't know, then the really deepest kind of ignorance is what you don't know, you don't know. The stuff you don't even know, you don't know. I mean, I know Donald Rumsfeld made that sort of famous in his testimony in front of the House and all that or the Senate. But actually, it first appeared, I have to set the record straight here, first appeared to my knowledge in a poem by D.H. Lawrence in 1917 called New Heaven and Earth, a rather long narrative poem about transitioning from this world to the next and all this other stuff. But anyway, at the end of it, there's a stanza that goes, I'm slightly paraphrasing, paraphrasing a poem by D.H. Lawrence. That's not good, but I'm paraphrasing. The stanza is something like, now here was I with my hand outstretched touching the unknown, the real unknown, the unknown unknown. So how do you get to the un how do you get to what you don't even know you don't know? Well, you do an experiment to find something out you don't know, or you try something, you interview a suspect or something like that, and then you find out you don't get the right result. Well, now you know there was something you didn't know you didn't know, and you have to go back to the beginning and start again somehow or another, taking something new into account, trying some new approach. And so I think failure is very valuable that way. And also, I think failure is valuable because if you didn't fail a lot, then the few successes you had wouldn't be as important. You know, we do this in sports all the time. Here, get this ball into that big net over there. Oh, but you can't use your hands. You know, I mean, <laughs> intentionally make it difficult to do so you'll fail mostly. But even outside of science, if you don't have some significant failures, the worst thing that could happen to a kid is that they never fail. Because then when they do fail, oh my God. Yes, yes. So, so little failures, I mean, I think that's one of the real values of science is that we have learned a method in science. We have a method in science where you can fail non-catastrophically. That is, your failures just build up and they're part of the process and we accept them and they're not catastrophes. They're not going to be the end of your career or the end of this or the end of that. You, you actually go back and get something out of them. And if you're clever, you include them in your thesis or find a way to wheedle them into your paper, you know, or whatever it is, or you just know about them and they help you. So that's critical, learning how to fail in a non-catastrophic way. In Only Murders in the Building, our protagonists start off in search of a simple, discoverable answer to a straightforward question, who killed Tim Konos? But that search leads to a far more complicated question like, what the heck is Charles Hayden Savage's relationship with his father? The closer we look at the elements of the simple whodunit, the more complicated and compelling the problems get. In science, do seemingly simple questions like how do we walk or say how do we smell 
become really very interesting the closer we look at them. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I think we have this idea, especially in modern science, we have this notion called reductionism, where we, you know, we kind of reduce the problem to its simpler and simpler elements. We take it apart, we take the pieces apart, thinking if we understand each of the individual parts, which is much easier than the whole big gamish at once, then we'll put the parts back together and see how it all works. It's like a clock somehow or another, all these springs and wheels and everything in it. But if you take it apart piece by piece and then figure out where each piece goes, you can see how it keeps time. Same thing would be the idea of the brain. But the remarkable thing is that that's not the way it's worked. The more reductionist we get, the more complex it seems to get. It doesn't get simpler. So we get down to the cellular level or the biochemical level, and it's just as complex as it is at the level of consciousness. And it doesn't tell us any more about consciousness. It's a remarkable thing. It's like, a, it's like the magic well. No matter how much water you take out of it, there's another bucket to be found down there. Right. Well, I like that, by the way. I uh, find that a very optimistic view. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's not, we were talking earlier about uh, living in a construct. It's not a procedurally generated reduction. The rules and the, the details change on each level. One hopes, yes, <laughs> one hopes. I mean, yes, and, and uh, there's a, a famous historian of science, uh, Charles Gillespie, who was at Princeton, died a couple years ago, who said that in science, revision is a victory. And I think that's a very important idea. Science is always being revised. I know we think it's full of answers and here, settle it. And that's, of course, part of our miserable educational system, which seems to think that teaching a science course and giving an exam, there's a yes or a no answer, a right and a wrong answer, which then disturbs people later on when they want to know whether to wear a mask or not wear a mask. And we go, yeah, well, 80% maybe, something like that, or today, yes, tomorrow, no. And, and But that's how science works. I mean, we revise it constantly, but at any one moment, it's the best answer we have. It's not that we're lazy, I don't think. It's just that it's the best answer we have. At the moment. And that changes. You know, best is not. I mean, look at the Olympics. Best only lasts for a year. And then somebody comes along and breaks the record. In his book, Ignorance, Dr. Firestein writes that science isn't actually about facts and knowledge. Science is actually the pursuit of ignorance. But Stuart, how does that look on a grant proposal? Well, it's what a grant proposal should be, of course, right? I mean, a grant proposal is the questions that you have, the things you want to do. I once had a conversation with Sidney Brenner, who was a famous molecular biologist, Nobel Prize winner and all the rest of that. And we were talking about funding and he said, he was quite a character. And he said, um, well, you know, NIH grants come in two parts. The first half of them are all the experiments you've already done. And then the second half are all the experiments you're never going to do. <laughs> That's how you write a grant. There's a, there's a, a kernel of truth to it, of course. Um, but still, I mean, I think grant writing is, I prefer to write a grant than a paper, to tell you the truth. A paper is stuff I've already done, I'm done with it, now I have to write it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's excess work to me. But a grant is where I get to think about the questions that are important. Now, you have to phrase them right so that you'll get funding, but that's what you want to do. How do you sell that idea or explain that idea or, or get the public to embrace that idea that you're searching for ignorance? Well, because it's from ignorance that the most creative work usually springs. It's from what we don't know. Um, I always say this about the, the NIH as an example. About three and a half or four percent of their budget, it varies from year to year, is devoted to what they call high risk, high impact studies. That is, these are proposals that have a very low probability of succeeding. But if they did, the findings would be really important. So that's about 3.5 or 4% of the budget. That's very admirable. But does that mean that 96.5% of the budget is devoted to incremental junk that we don't really care about? I mean, that's the implication there, right? Don't we want the exciting stuff? Don't we want to gamble a bit? Isn't that what we ought to be doing? It used to be my sister and I could get into a really good fight about any number of things. But now every potential argument gets shot down early when she says, how great would it be if somebody could invent a handheld looky uppy device that we could all know the correct answer? <laughs> instantly and with more facts than anyone can hold in their minds potentially waiting at everybody's fingertips does our educational system need to be looked at yeah I think it wouldn't be such a bad idea um, you know I call it my third hemisphere the phone it's the only one that really <laughs> works anymore to tell you the truth the most dependable of the three um, and yes of course I mean if we have all these facts now it's more lately come to light that some of these facts are unreliable 
And so what we really, I think, need to think about in education is how do you decide what's a reliable fact? What's a reliable piece of information? How do you determine that this information is more reliable than that piece of information? What do you know about its source? I mean, this is, this is what I think we mean by critical thinking. This, I believe, is how we should educate people, yes, not on the facts. They can get the facts, as you say, on their phone. You know, I allow students to use their phones during exams. I don't care. You look it up, but make sure you look up the right fact. You know, that's what I want to know, how, wh whether you can actually look up the right answer and figure out among all the junk that's out there, which is the best of the answers to this question or that. That's a huge, that's a huge, huge issue. You absolutely have to come back. <laughs> okay, I could do that. <laughs> Maybe three times, yeah. in fact. <laughs> it's a big issue. Big issue. In Only Murders in the Building, the building, or at least the president of the co-op, wants Mabel, Charles, and Oliver evicted, but they have a podcast. And the podcast is popular, and the court of popular opinion wields extraordinary power in the fictional world of the Dakota, the Belmore. I mean, the Arconia. Yeah. <laughs> and we live in a democracy, and lots of science has public funding. Stuart, does the public perception of science affect the science that gets done? Sure, I suppose it must in some ways. I mean, here I am on your show because I'd like to, you know, improve the public perception of science. I think it's extremely important, the public perception of science, the way the public sees science, the way they think about science. Um, it, uh, so much of our lives is tied to science. Um, it's such an important influence. And I mean, this is relatively new. Recognize that of all the systems that we have for organizing human knowledge and human thinking, philosophy, theology and religion, economics, politics, law, science is the new kid on the block. It's only been here a few hundred years. All those other ones have been here for millennia. So I think we're still not good at using it. We still don't know exactly how to make use of this incredibly mm -hmm. powerful tool. It's important that the funding is public so that the advances are public? Yes, I think very much so. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to think of another model. I, I can't think of one, actually, in science. I mean, even, even in sort of more totalitarian countries, less democratic countries, it seems to me that most of the science winds up being somehow public because it's published. Um, it's out there. I mean, one never knows what's not published. Of course, you can't know what isn't published. So, um, so I can't be positive of that, but one has the feeling that it's fairly public, that it's a, it, it, it all happens in a very public sphere for the most part. Um, there are little corners that are secret here or there. I mean, the Defense Department, I'm sure, knows all kinds of things that <laughs> they're not letting out. All the way back to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we humans love the story of a scientist who ruined or upended the world with his creations. And after writing and producing 10 seasons of Science Goes to the Movies, I've come to realize that movies often confuse what a scientist does with what an engineer does. Hmm. So is it a scientist's goal to make anything useful or, or even make anything tangible? Well, sure. I mean, I, I would love to. I, I, my laboratory does what I would call basic or fundamental research. We're looking for fundamental mechanisms. Happens to be how the olfactory system works, how we, our sense of smell works, which may not seem terribly important to a lot of people. I don't know. For years, we were what I would call a cul-de-sac of neuroscience until COVID came along and people lost their sense of smell and went, oh, this really sucks. I'm not very happy about this. So now it's a little bit more current. But what we're really doing in this is learning how cells recognize molecules, right? I mean, odors are molecules. And it so happens many of them look a lot like drugs that bind to other things in our body and do things, dopamine and serotonin and other neuro hormones and neurotransmitters. So I feel like we're studying these larger questions that could add to, maybe not directly, but indirectly would add to the way we design drugs or the way we discover drugs of some value. So I think we all have some feeling that we'd love to see it be useful, but we have no idea how that will turn out to be. It may be useful, it may not be, it may not be in our lifetimes, but in a future lifetime, and that's fine, you know. So you just plug away. There's a wonderful story about Benjamin Franklin witnessing the first human flight, which was in hot air balloons in Paris, France. And somebody standing next to him said, well, this is really exciting, but what use do you think it will be? And Franklin's response was, well, what use is a newborn baby? Now, that's a little hard. 
<laughs> but it's true, isn't it? I mean, they're really no use at all. But, <laughs> but, but, but some of them turn out, so we take care of them all, you know, right. and hope for the best. And that works out for the most part, right? Right. Few of them are bad apples, but <laughs> most of them are okay. In his books and TED Talks, our guest has written and spoken about the difference between how science is pursued versus how it's perceived. So for all the screenwriters out there, can you give us a sense of what a scientist would look like and feel like? Should they be wearing white lab coats and shouting Eureka all the time? <laughs> <laughs> sure, they could do that, I guess. <laughs> they have to be poorly dressed. There's no question about that. <laughs> Bad haircuts, things like that. Um, it, it's funny, Eureka is the one thing I've never heard in the lab. And, and in fact, there's a, I think Isaac Asimov said this, what a scientist really wants to say when they see a piece of data is not Eureka, but, oh, that's weird. <laughs> because that really tells you there's something more interesting here than just, oh, Eureka, we were right. You know, so what, you were right. Then you got to, then what do you do? <laughs> so it's often more interesting to think about the way things don't quite work out, the way they go awry, the way they, the way mistakes get, get made. Um, I'd also say that, you know, fictional science characters are sort of strange in the sense that there never was a Frankenstein, right? I mean, nobody's ever done, there never was a Jurassic Park or a China Syndrome or any of these sort of fictionalized science things that scientists get blamed for as if we're megalomaniacs that want to take over the world. I mean, I have to say that the scientists I know don't even want to be chair of the department. <laughs> so <laughs> taking over the world is like of no interest whatsoever to me. Have you seen the world lately? <laughs> I don't want to be in charge. So I, I think that would be a trope that would be nice to see kind of go by the wayside. But maybe that's what makes movies exciting. I don't know. I'm not a screenwriter. <laughs> Let's talk Sherlock Holmes. I love the BBC's Benedict Cumberbatch, Martin Freeman, Holmes, Watson extravaganza. But the Sherlock Holmes method of layering facts, one on top of the other, to solve an interesting puzzle is only guaranteed to be useful when you have a screenwriter or a creator or a puzzle manufacturer forcing those facts to line up in an interesting, orderly way. Real life is messy. So in real life science then, are less orderly methods more functional than the Holmes Watson? Well, we try and be orderly, but it doesn't usually work. So yes, you know, we depend. I mean, there's this idea of serendipity in science, which I think is often misinterpreted as being sort of dumb luck that, you know, you, you <laughs> happen on something. But I don't think it is just dumb luck. I think, you know, Louis Pasteur said chance favors the prepared mind. And he was the beneficiary of a lot of chance, a lot of luck as a serendipity, but he was prepared for it. I mean, lawyers don't make serendipitous scientific discoveries, right? Only scientists do. And scientists don't make serendipitous legal right. discoveries or ideas either. So you have to be working at something and then you have to be clever enough or imaginative enough or perceptive enough to pay attention to what doesn't fit, to pay attention to the little weird bit over there, to not just sweep that under the rug and say, oh, that's just an outlier or something. And then I think you've made, you, you can make a discovery, you know, and that's where those things come from. So, so it is messy, but you, but you know, you can't purposely be messy either, <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. When I first started walking into labs, I was surprised that they were messy. Oh, it's a wreck. <laughs> <laughs> the messier they are, the better, in my opinion. I walk into a nice, neat lab. I'm, I, this, nothing's going on here. What's happening here? No. <laughs> Stuart, did, did you like only murders in the billing? Well, I did enjoy it. But no, and normally I would not even try watching it because I stay away from these episodic series because I'm a terrible binge watcher. I start the first program, you know, at seven o'clock in the evening and then at five or six a.m. I'm just finishing up the season because I can't stop doing it. <laughs> so I just avoid it altogether most of the time. Well, in a lot of ways that that do you think that episodic TV is 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 training us to be better scientists because it leaves us hanging. We, we need to know more. We need to know more. And so we need to watch the next thing. I, I think you're right about that. Yes. I mean, it is great. I mean, that's why I just can't not stop, you know, because I, I think, wow, there's really a good question here. This, I think anything that leaves you with a question instead of an answer is a good idea. Mm. And answer is the end of the line. That's it. That's finished, right? So, I mean, I thought this was marvelously creative because they seem to have solved the problem only to find 
find a way to start a new problem so you could have a second season. I mean, that's what writing is about for television, I guess, and all that. But nonetheless, that's what you want to be left with, right? Do you remember the Who Killed Larry, whatever it was? Who Killed Jr. Who Killed Jr. It was Larry Hagman was the actor, <laughs> right? I mean, that went on for months over a summer, right? Right. We are, okay, well, you're a neuroscientist. Are we just, are we as humans just really geared to need to know the answers? Well, I like to think we're geared for curiosity anyway, that curiosity is an important thing in the way we live our lives, that, that this is what we do with this big brain, that who knows why it's here, but it's here. And one of the marvelous things about it is that it seems to be quite curious. Mm. And I think that's, a, that's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We are out of time. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. It's been a great conversation. <laughs>